Yesterday we saw Facebook get taken off the internet. I don't know why it went down, but I know that for more than five hours, Facebook wasn't used to deepen divides, destabilize democracies, and make young girls and women feel bad about their bodies. Today we have with us Francis Haugen, otherwise known as the Facebook whistleblower. Frances Haugen is a former Facebook product manager. She's a veteran of big tech with experience at Google, Pinterest, and Yelp. During her time at Facebook, Frances became increasingly alarmed by the choices the company makes, prioritizing their own profits over public safety and putting people's lives at risk. As a last resort and at great personal risk, Frances made the courageous decision to blow the whistle on Facebook. So let's get right into it. So Francis, you are a former Facebook employee specializing in algorithm mm -hmm. management. And in addition to Facebook, you have worked on ranking systems at Google, Pinterest, and companies <laughs> like Yelp. Mm -hmm. So you revealed internal Facebook documents that state that Facebook knew its Instagram platform was harming young girls. Can you mm -hmm. summarize the findings for us with respect to teens on Instagram and, and kind of what were some of those really alarming statistics that you shed light on? Well, I think it's important to remember, it's not just uh, young women who are being impacted by, by platforms like Instagram and, and, and Facebook. Um, it's also teenage boys. Um, Facebook knows that when it comes to addictive behavior, right? So, so teenagers are not as good at self-regulation as adults are. And the highest rate of addiction to these platforms happens when kids are 14 years old. So it's not just eating disorders, it applies to all kids because these things are like cigarettes. Teenage brains are still developing and kids say, I know these platforms make me feel bad, I can't stop, and if I leave, I'll be ostracized. Specifically with regard to teenage girls, uh, we know that the algorithms, because um, they use something called engagement-based ranking, that's where you prioritize content based on its ability to elicit a reaction from someone. That might be a like, it might be a comment, it might be a reshare. Uh, that when you do that, the most extreme content gets the most distribution because it is the most likely to provoke a reaction from people. Um, what Facebook's own documents show is that people can come in there and follow um, a pretty innocuous interest like healthy eating. And just by clicking on the content that Facebook provides, they'll get shown more and more extreme content and get led to things like anorexia and self-harm content. Sometimes kids in it, or even adults, let's be honest here, um, will engage in self-soothing behavior. So they'll be anxious about something, they'll be stressed, they'll be depressed. And they'll self-soothe by just scrolling. And unfortunately, when kids are feeling anxious or depressed because of the content on Facebook, having a, a coping mechanism of consuming more content, dissociating a little bit, isn't constructive. And it just leads kids further and further down these rabbit holes and sometimes leads to things like self-harm or even, or even suicide. And so I, I believe in your uh, papers, it was mentioned that 13.5% of teen girls had said Instagram makes thoughts of suicide worse. Is, is that what you, what you found? Um, it depends on where in the world where, where you're looking. I think the 13% statistic is specifically about in the UK, but around the world, teenage girls do say, both teenage girls and teenage boys say that uh, self-harm, uh, suicide, eating disorders, all these things are made worse by Instagram. The part that's quite concerning is Facebook's own researchers have said, not only is Instagram bad for kids, it's significantly worse than other platforms because TikTok is about doing fun things with your friends. It's about performance. Uh, Snapchat is about augmented reality, faces, fil fun filters. Reddit is at least vaguely about ideas. Um, but Instagram is about comparing lifestyles and bodies. And that unfortunately is something that can really harm impressionable um, teenagers. So let's talk a little bit more about that. For those of us who are, you know, a parent, we may not be super savvy with algorithms per se, but let's take a tangible example of say a 12 year old girl who mm -hmm. has an Instagram account. And we should note that uh, 13 is the she age. Have one. You, yeah. you should be, yeah. you should be 13, but yeah many can slip through the cracks. Sure. Um, 
how would that work? They were looking at a salad recipe and they decide mm -hmm. to like that post. And then what's actually happening behind the scenes in the algorithm to take that child down a potentially dangerous path? Sure. Let's imagine that child uh, was feeling, you know, maybe they, they just wanted to eat more healthy. They'd heard that like they, maybe their friends were trying out a diet, who knows? And they went on Instagram and they searched for healthy recipes. Facebook has a model where when you put in something like a search query, it goes, oh, interesting. Is this a new interest of yours? And they have language models that map the words in those queries to interests that, that Facebook knows about. Every piece of content on Instagram or Facebook has little tags on it invisibly in the background. Some of those are the, the direct, <clears throat> some of those are the direct result of the words used in the post. Some of that are directly from characteristics of the image, maybe the color, maybe the lighting, maybe it's who posted it. They can be characteristics based on what are other, uh, other users who are like you and what did they engage with? But all these little components are kept in the background. And when Facebook is trying to decide what to show you next on Instagram, they look at all the possible content that you could be exposed to. And they say, hmm, interesting, based on you looking at this recent new interest of healthy recipes, I bet there's some more healthy eating related things. And as you engage with the, that content, um, back in 2018, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook said, engagement-based ranking, prioritizing content based on the ability to elicit a reaction is dangerous because people are drawn to engage with more extreme content. And even when we asked them afterwards, did you like that content? They say no. And he said, don't worry, AI will save us. The part that he didn't say though, was that required Facebook to identify what content needed in AI. And the reality is that Facebook has not gone in there and finally figured out these gradations. They might be willing to block words like the word anorexia sometimes, um, or pro Anna. But when you start to get into things where uh, you know, teenagers develop visual conventions for talking about eating disorders. Maybe it's things like showing thigh bones or showing other things that show how gaunt you are. These characteristics can get learned by the AI. It's not like the AI is saying, well, you want your child to have an eating disorder. It just learns that people who are interested in healthy eating seem to be drawn to these content if we show it to them. And that's what gets dangerous. The AI is always scanning for your vulnerabilities and looking for what rabbit hole could it pull you down? And that's what happens. So it's almost capitalizing on our weaknesses inadvertently, and perhaps not even with any malintent. It's just naturally taking us there because, you know, in this case, let's say teenage girls have that vulnerability that could lead to potentially very dangerous consequences. Is that what you're saying? So, so often Facebook has gone out and said, it doesn't make any sense for us to want to harm our users. And I've, I've never said they set, set out to intentionally harm them. It's like you said, it's unintentional. But what they did do is they set up a system that, uh, was, that kind of wandered blindly, that all it was trying to do was optimize for this abstract idea of engagement without being able to come in and say, is the, are the things that we're recommending actually good for teenagers? Um, and I think that's one of the conversations we're starting to have is realizing that we have to have more opinions on what we want the information environment to be like for kids. And on that point, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the larger context, smartphones themselves are being put in the hands of children at younger and younger ages. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask my kids, they'll say not, not young enough. But right now, the average age in the U.S., I believe, is 10 years old. So do you think as a society, we should be rethinking the whole context here, you know, Instagram and Facebook included, but we do potentially have a larger problem with the way these devices are shaping childhoods, um, largely unchecked. Would you agree? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, uh, I, I think we do need to have a real um, serious conversation on what is the appropriate role for technology with kids because you know, we don't let kids smoke either because we know that they don't, they're not actually making choices. You know, they're, they're, they're like we talked about before, they have vulnerabilities that are more pronounced than for adults. Um, one of my godsons is five. And I was talking to his father recently about some of these issues. And he was saying, uh, he can already tell that his son understands the difference between full YouTube and YouTube kids. And he'll be like, no, 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 no. I want full YouTube, hmm. right? 
And it's because, you know, like, I, I guess maybe the algorithms work better. I don't know. Um, but like kids, kids connect with the addictiveness of these products. They wouldn't come out and say, I want to be addicted. But like these things are designed the way they are because it draws us in. And so unless we're really conscious about the risks that are happening here and the fact that these are minds that are still maturing and developing, we need to make choices on what do we want to expose kids to. Now, the counter argument here, some folks are pushing back saying that this set of papers uh, is, you know, cherry picked, the, the findings mm. are exaggerated, um, you know, the head of Instagram pledges as a parent that, you know, he deeply cares about children and he's worked for many years and they've spent, you know, what is it, uh, $5 billion a year to uh, protect the safety uh, and health of our online, you know, youth. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, are these claims sort of baseless or, you know, has mm -hmm. there been any meaningful impact uh, on, you know, putting in some protections here? Or what do you say to the to the folks who try and discount this data that you've uh, revealed? So I want to be real, I want to clarify one stat there. They have not spent $5 billion protecting kids. They have spent $5 billion across all of the family of apps. So that's Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, all their products, just around safety in general. God. But I want to, I want to be clear, their profits and for the upcoming year are, are on track to be something like $45 billion. And it's not a question of is $5 billion a big number? It's a question of, is it a big enough number? Because right now, we think there are problems on things like Facebook in the United States, but we're using the cleanest, safest version of Facebook. Facebook has spent 87% of its misinformation budget on the United States in English, right? The rest of the world gets 13% for brand safety, which is like, do we want to show ads next to like unpleasant content? They only spend 9% of that budget on English. Is that not crazy? So are, yeah. are young girls potentially or any youth uh, even more at risk outside of the US? Oh, unquestionably, unquestionably. If you don't speak English, you are not using uh, anywhere near as safe a version of, of Instagram or Facebook as the English version. It's but to like finish going the, to the theme park, right? So you're going yeah. to the, you know, the Six Flags that's there all year round with the actual seatbelts. Yeah. And then you do the, the midway that just pops up on the weekend, right? Yeah. You've got like the two totally different levels of safety. That's really yeah. alarming. Only, only everyone sees the same gate outside. It just, in one of them, we see English language Facebook. And then there's an exact same logo. It says Spanish language Facebook, only it's nowhere near as safe. Think about that. So, but let's talk, think a little bit about the role of kids. Like how much safety is, is Facebook investing in kids and in Instagram? There are significantly fewer people working on integrity at Instagram than there are at Facebook. And when uh, they ask questions like, should there be an Instagram kids? You know, they say, we can't keep kids off. The thing that, that's crazy to me about this is Facebook won't disclose what they're doing to keep under 13s off the platform. Like they currently have estimates. So this is, this is a, a thing that most people aren't aware of. For everyone on Facebook's systems, they have an estimated age. They know, like, because enough people don't lie about their ages, because enough kids, like your kids, wait till they're 13 to sign on, they can figure out how old, how, what's, the, what, what's the real age of every real 14-year-old on the platform, or every 13 and a half year old. And it's amazing, when we were working with the Senate before the first hearing, one of the staffers, one of Marshall Blackburn's staffers, reached out and said, hey, there's this chart. This chart doesn't make any sense. It says for some age cohorts, you know, some birth years, 10 to 15% of 10 year olds were on the platform. How is that possible? How can Facebook know that 10 to 15% of 10 year olds were on Facebook? And it's because they have this estimated age data. Do you think Facebook would do a better or worse job at keeping under 13s off the platform if they had to publish every year the retrospective data saying what fraction of 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds were on the platform in past years. I bet they do a better job. But so the last you're saying thing, they actually yeah. know that there is a cohort of kids who are 10 years old actively using it just based on their user profile, but they do nothing about it. 
I, I, I am confident. So the, they know for sure of today's 14 year olds, they know what fraction of today's real or, you know, actual 14 year olds, what fraction of them were on when they were 10. They could Got publish it. that number today. I also strongly believe that if they want to have way, way, way more kids under the age of 13 off the platform, they could do it in a heartbeat because other tech platforms have said behind closed doors, that's true. And I've talked to academics and researchers who've said that. And as a data scientist, I can imagine ways of doing it. The reality is Facebook doesn't want to be transparent with us about what they're doing. You know, you were talking before about the idea of these are just cherry picked doc documents. There's a really easy way to show the real picture, which is publish more documents, right? And what's amazing is that when the Wall Street Journal published the first, I mean, I think it was like six documents. They're like, here, we're gonna let you see six documents. They warned Facebook before they published those documents and uh, Facebook promised not to front run them, i.e. put something up right before they published. And the night before Facebook rushed out two documents and they were the two documents with the smallest sample size, the ones that, where they interviewed the fewest number of kids. And they were like, look at these documents. They only, they only have small numbers of people who are interviewed, ignoring the documents the next day the Wall Street Journal published had 100,000 users in them, 50,000 users in them. Wow. Well, yeah. uh, this is why we need you to keep doing what you're doing, Francis. So let's talk now for parents, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's one thing we all hear you out there being so courageous and bringing this information to light. Uh, but we have kids who are every day still yep. actively using the platform. So for those parents watching right now, um, you know, we're not only up against huge tech companies, it's huge social pressures from peers who, you know, totally. in many places have begun using these things, you know, at younger and younger ages, as we've discussed. So mm -hmm. what advice would you have for parents out there? Say two, two buckets of parents, the parents with kids already using social media, what should they be aware of? Mm -hmm. And then for those parents who are trying hard to delay that process, um, despite the, the, the requests sometimes every week, uh, what would you say to those, that group of parents uh, with all that you know? So I think one of the most important things parents can do is um, there, there are apps you can install on your phone that will help you set, um, they're called like time allowances. So basically coming and saying, you know, kids have self-regulation issues. A real thing that's happening today is that kids are, you know, the last thing they see before they go to bed is, you know, a kid bullying them on Instagram. You know, the, the first thing they say in the morning is someone being mean to them when they wake up. You know, or, or it's just like, you know, like I was saying before, they're self-soothing by scrolling, putting a time budget on your kids and saying, you know, I'm gonna, you, you can use your phone, but you can only use it for two hours a day, three hours a day. Like how much time do you really need to be on your phone versus reading versus doing something else? Um, I think that's a really important thing. The second thing is be involved in your kid's digital life, just like you are in their physical life. You know, it's totally okay to say, can I see your Instagram feed? Because one, it can help you have really interesting conversations with your kids. You can be like, oh, explain this to me. Like, what, what is this? You know, tell me more about this. Or, oh, cool. I saw you had this recipe here. Do you want to cook it with me sometime? Right? It's a great way to like learn more about your kids interested in. But the other reason why it's really important is that sometimes kids start to go down these rabbit holes and parents only learn after it's way too late that their kids were really led, in this astray, led astray by things like Instagram. Um, while I was in the UK, I met with Ian Russell, whose daughter um, uh, uh, committed suicide um, after spending months and months looking at self-harm content. And it's one of those things where, you know, checking in with your kids and just seeing what's, what's their default discover screen, what's, what, what, what's the content they're seeing from the people they follow, um, you know, at once a week, once every couple of weeks, it can, you can make it into a fun thing. You can make it into something about learning each other and about connection. Um, maybe you could show them your phone, right? Talk about how you manage your devices. So little things like that, I think are really important. Um, for kids, for parents that are um, trying to, you know, give their kids more time to be kids. Um, you know, The Social Dilemma is very accessible. It's the documentary that was on Netflix um, and it's about how these systems work and like what are the motivations of how they're designed. Kids, and this is even true for kids who are currently using social media. All kids deserve to understand how, how that these platforms treat them like products. Anything where you don't pay for it, you are the product. You're being sold to advertisers. 
And I think once kids understand the forces that they're under on these systems, it makes it easier for them to make good choices for themselves as well. And then the last thing that covers both these camps is I think PTAs should get more involved because the reality is that at some of the most prestigious private schools in the Bay Area, these are the private schools that tech executives send their children to, they have community standards where you talk to these 16 year olds, these 14 year olds, and they say, we just don't use social media here. That's just not what we do. Like we as a community made that choice. Because remember kids right now often don't get to make these choices in isolation. The network effects are real. And so starting to have real conversations with PTAs, with teachers and saying, what do we want our community to be like? You know, this is a public health emergency. How do we want to make sure our kids have the best chance they can have? That's the thing that parents can at least start the conversation. On. This is so true. I like to say you blew the whistle, but the moms need to sound the alarm, right? It's mm. up to us to, to come together and really to do what mm -hmm. you say and, and think about what kind of a community and what kind of a childhood do we want our kids to have? Um, mm -hmm. And so right now, I know you've proposed some solutions uh, because, you know, I, I like your approach here and you're not saying it's all bad. You do, you know, think that there are some positive elements of social media. It brings connection. It can give us joy uh, in the right context. So in your opinion, is there a way to make these tools safer in a realistic way in a hmm. meaningful timeline? Because I feel a little bit like the parent of the kids who are the guinea pig generation where oh, we're yeah. just letting, it's the wild west. And you know, in five years, eh, we'll have it figured out. But by then it'll be too late for the kids right now yeah. who are exposed to all of this stuff. So is there hope in the you know short term yeah. for changes? And, and maybe you can just give us, I know we have to wrap up soon, but some ideas of what those changes are or those solutions that you would like to see put into place right away. You know, the part, one of the things that I'm kind of shocked by is, you know, Facebook could talk to pediatricians today and find out like what is an appropriate number of hours a day kids should use Instagram, right? I, you know, I think we can all agree 12 hours a day is probably too many hours. Maybe three hours is too many hours, but I don't know, it's some number, right? Um, being able to come in there and find kids who are looking at self-harm content, Facebook could do that today. And they could come in and give kids even more options. You know, imagine if Facebook asked every kid who used the platform for more than 10 hours a week and said, how many hours do you wanna use this per day, right? That's a thing they could do tomorrow, trivial. Um, I think this is one of those things. Facebook, if they wanted to show they were serious about children and about respecting the autonomy of children, they would develop tools that gave children more control. Um, imagine if they stepped in there and instead of you know requiring you to search for very specific words that they consider maybe anorexia related, you know, if, if too much of your content is around fashion and body image, or, or maybe even ask kids, literally, do you feel like Instagram is making your body image worse? And the kid says, yes. Imagine if Instagram presented that kid with choices. They could do that today. These are not rocket science moves. And the reason why Instagram doesn't do it is they don't want to give any kind of indication that they might be responsible for these problems. And so this is one of those things where moms can put pressure on Facebook. They can put pressure on the brands that they buy that advertise on Facebook and say, you need to not spend money on, on Instagram until, or on Facebook until Facebook can treat our kids with dignity because our kids deserve the best. They do. They do. And, and I know, Francis, you've been quoted as saying that you intentionally do not give many interviews because you want this issue to be about the documents and, yes. and not about mm -hmm. yourself being in the spotlight. So we're so appreciative of you taking the time to speak to us today. Is it particularly important for you to get your message across to parents? Yes. One of the things that the documents are very, very clear about is that Facebook knows that because parents didn't live through having social media when they were 16, they don't understand what it's like to have a teenage brain and be engaging with social media or have been steeped in so much social media since they were, you know, 12, 11 years old, right? How does that shape a kid's identity or how they interact with their friends? And one of the things that I really, really worry about is uh, Facebook's documents say kids feel profoundly alone because their parents don't have the tools right now on how to support them through these issues. 
And so doing outreach around kids, around educators, and that means a lot to me because we, we like you said, five years is, is, is not soon enough because there's a generation of kids that are being deeply impacted right now. So tell us what's next for you and how parents who are watching, who want to support your efforts and they want to learn more and get involved, um, mm -hmm. where can people go to stay connected to your movement? Hmm. Um, so my hope, so right now, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't have great me mechanisms for people to stay in touch. I do have a Twitter, a, a Twitter account. So I'm Francis Taugen on Twitter. Um, that's probably the best way if you just want to see what I'm going to be up to in the near future. Um, my goal in 2020 is to begin um, uh, working on planting a youth movement, initially mostly focused on college students, with the goal of both having college students supporting high school students and around beginning to put pressure both on Facebook and on our government to take actions to help us get the social media that we deserve. Because when I look at how change is going to come, it's going to become we because we've been pushing and pushing over a period of time. Hopefully it won't be five years, but it might be. Um, and in that meantime, I'm, I'm a realist. I know that a 19 year old will talk to a 13 year old better than I will. They'll connect better. And so if we want to make sure that every kid in the United States or even every kid in the world has people they can turn to and say, I'm struggling, I need help. I want to make sure that we have a scalable way to make sure that those kids get that support. That's amazing. And don't forget about the 10 year olds too, the ones that don't have the phones. Yeah. Yet, because that's, <laughs> that's the group that you really got it. Once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's even harder to push it back in. Yeah. It is so important. It's not talked about enough and it's not cool to be the kid without the phone or the kid who's not on Instagram. It's, it's really not cool. And as a parent, it can be exhausting. So yeah. again, thank you for all you're doing. We yeah. really do appreciate it. And uh, good luck. Thank you so much. We were so fortunate to have the fearless Francis Haugen, former Facebook employee with us on Live, Work, Thrive. Francis has blown the whistle on the dangers for our children. Now it is up to us as parents to sound the alarm. We will be following Francis and her continued efforts to ensure every child can live, work, and thrive. Good night.